Welcome, everyone. Uh, lovely to be here, as always. Um, as Andrew alluded to, I have got my locket, so I'm on the back end of a little bit of a cold. Uh, so please be gentle with me tonight. I'm a bit, bit bunged up, as you can probably hear. Uh, but it is my pleasure, as always, to be here. Uh, for those of you that haven't come to one of my webinars before, uh, my name is Stephen Marks, fairly frequent contributor to this uh, channel, All Things Mental Health. Um, I've been a registered mental health nurse since 2013. Um, I also hold a master's in advanced clinical practice. Uh, but my day job is a senior lecturer in mental health nursing. <laughs> Um, and there's plenty of other sessions. So if I refer to kind of other topics, um, chances are there'll be something in the catalogue um, or there'll be something coming up uh, to expand on that. So what we're going to look at tonight is really a, a kind of a whistle-stop tour of personality disorder. Again, it's very hard to get the depth um, that I would like. Um, but this is really just going to be an overview of the various types of personality. Um, what makes it a disorder? How does that differ from, you know, the personality that we all have? Uh, we'll be taking a bit of a closer look at Emotionally Unstable Personality Disorder, EUPD, uh, which you've probably all come across. Um, it tends to be the one that's most commonly encountered in mental health settings um, or kind of in need of support, perhaps through an ambulance call out, um, presentations to A&E. Uh, so we'll take a bit of a closer look at that one. We'll have a think about some of the controversy and stigma that comes with this. Uh, and then we'll do a little recap of the kind of treatment options. How do we engage this client group? Uh, how do we manage the care? Um, and then at the end, I'm just going to, we probably won't have time to go through the whole paper. But I did just want to highlight um, uh, quite an important paper on stigma that's experienced both by mental health patients and mental health staff in general hospital settings. Uh, so we'll see how we're doing for time when we get a bit closer. But I think at the very least, you can then go away and, and look that paper up and, and have a little uh, read through it. So I think before we start, I think the first thing to make clear is that personality disorder is a fairly contentious term in the industry. Um, many service user groups and patients kind of reject the term as they see it as victim blaming or, you know, they feel that the the sense of being told that you have a disordered personality um, is quite offensive. Um, it's certainly not something that I think people kind of want that diagnosis, I think, because there is so much stigma associated with it. So I just wanted to put that on the table before we go. It is the term that we've got, although there are kind of challenges and battles to maybe think about different ways or change the way that we deliver services. Um, but just wanted to pop that little disclaimer there. Um, I think this leads on quite nicely. If anyone was on my last session, we were thinking about CAMS and trauma, sort of childhood, adolescence. Um, and we looked at the kind of disorders that one might develop, de develop in childhood and how that might affect your adult life. And I think, you know, if you are a kind of victim of trauma, abuse, you're much more likely to develop a personality disorder later in your life. So we'll revisit um, some of the developmental stages and how kind of abuse and trauma at that stage can impact people over the course of their lifespan. But personality, you know, psychologists have researched this for decades and decades. Um, it felt to be a unique formation of our thoughts, emotions, perceptions, um, all of which influence our behaviour. So personalities start to become determined in childhood um, and all of our early life experiences will impact how we relate to other people and view ourselves. And you know that yourself, you know, if you've got kids and you can compare and contrast, sometimes kids in the same household can be vastly different. Think about your colleagues, your family, your friends, um, people that might have taught you, you know, personality is so, so unique to us. Um, and what we're going to look at tonight is perhaps what makes it a kind of a clinical issue to become disordered. Because, you know, having a few personality deficits or flaws doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get a diagnosis of a disorder. That's quite uh, robust to get that. 
Um, so personality disorder is an umbrella term, and there are many different types, and they all present in slightly different ways. Um, Wiley put forward this kind of, if you wanted to give a definition that probably applies to them all, it's a long-standing, pervasive, inflexible, extreme, and persistent pattern of behavior and inner experience. And that's what makes it more of a disorder. Um, I think like most things within mental health, what we look at is the impact that it has on the individual. Um, so, you know, if if these behavior patterns are causing that person to become upset or distressed, then that is quite clinically significant. Um, and it indicates that that person might be more amenable to work in, in therapy and, and, you know, trying to get some change um, or, or better ways to manage thoughts and behaviors and and that kind of cycle. So as I alluded, um, there's not one cause, um, and it's not to say that everyone who is abused or neglected will develop a personality disorder. Um, in terms of prevalence, there's about 8 to 15% of the population that will have a personality disorder. Um, so these are more just risk factors rather than actual things that are going to guarantee it. But any kind of trauma, you know, such as bereavement of a parent, um, but parenting style is very, very important here. So, you know, even if you are not kind of abused in the sense of physically or sexually, if you've got parents who are quite unsupporting, invalidating, perhaps highly critical, don't comfort the child, distant, cold, judgmental, all of that has such a powerful impact on the developing brain. Um, and as we touched upon in the last session, we know that abuse and trauma actually causes changes, physical changes to the brain, the neural networks. So it's a huge, huge kind of physical component there um, at a neurodevelopmental level. So thinking about all of the things that we need, and you can probably link this to things like Maslow's hierarchy. I'm sure you've all come across that. But these are generally accepted core human needs, things that we all need to kind of feel safe, to feel loved, um, stability, nurturing, empathy, acceptance. As we grow up, we want more autonomy. We want to feel competent. We want to have our own sense of identity. Um, we also want the freedom to express our needs and emotions and have them met. Think about kids, you know, that spontaneity and play. Sadly, that wears off you know, for a lot of adults, but, you know, some of the greatest friends I've got are those ones that still have that sense of fun. Um, and there's something about, you know, what carries through from your childhood personality into adult is very much shaped by the world around you. Now, obviously, a baby has quite simple needs. You know, you're really talking about just keeping it alive, feed, changing it. Um, but certainly as people become more complex into childhood and into adolescence, that's when things start to get, you know, could potentially go wrong. So we're bringing a bit of kind of attachment theory here. This uh, would be very kind of prominent on any kind of like social work syllabus, um, especially if you're kind of children and family social worker. Um, but this here kind of represents what are a healthy cycle of attachment. So if we start at the top, um, if we've got a baby with any kind of need, whether it's hungry, it's wet, it's kind of done its nappy, it's cold, that need is signaled to the carer through crying. Um, and if the parent or carer responds appropriately in a timely way, those needs are met, the baby relaxes, and that's what we would say is quite a healthy cycle. Now, if you are a baby with needs, and maybe you are signaling to your carer, the parent, um, through crying, and maybe you're not getting a timely response, maybe that response is inconsistent, maybe there's a lack of response, maybe that response comes with anger, any kind of negative interaction at this point that results in the need remaining unmet results in the baby you know staying distressed and what it's trying to learn is that it signals a need um, and that is met but if that need is not met through kind of signaling that it, it becomes quite maladaptive quite disrupted attachment the baby doesn't fully understand how to summon help and connect to the people that are caregiving I mean, that's a very, you know, very binary 
oversimplified, but it's just to highlight some of the differences between kind of healthy um, and disrupted attachment cycles. And then things get even more complex with teenagers. You know, if you've if you are a parent to teenager, you will know that they have quite complex, quite emotional lives. Um, there can be quite a lot of conflict here. You know, even if your child um, was kind of you got on really well, there's quite often some conflict there as the teenager kind of matures. Um, they get more access to society and experiences. And that's why that time is so pivotal. It's because they're no longer reliant on just the parent to meet those core needs. Those needs start to develop sexually, romantically, experimenting with drugs and alcohol, wanting to develop a sense of identity, thinking about careers, thinking about performance. So all of this, you know, absolutely really ripe conditions to develop mental health problems if things in the environment aren't going so well. So these are some of the things that can affect a child or a teenager um, and again may well be a risk factor for developing some kind of personality disorder. So chaotic home life, maybe a parent with addiction issues, domestic violence, mental health problems, exclusion, any kind of bullying, especially severe bullying. Um, maybe some, if you're having problems forming healthy relationships at home, the chances are that you are not socialized very well and aren't going to form kind of healthy, stable friendships. You might relate to your peers in a way that um, is not kind of conducive to long-term healthy friendships. That rejection can then further isolate the child or the teenager, and that can result in young people having a very distorted view of themselves and relationships and the way that we interact with each other at a very young age. And twin studies in this highlight that there's a kind of moderately high heritability to personality disorder. But of course, if you're a twin and you're, you're not separated, if you're raised in the same household, again, it's very difficult then to tease out what's nature and, and what's nurture. And I think in mental health and in most kind of human sciences, I think there's always going to be a bit of both. So when we think about personality disorders, they tend to be split up into clusters. Um, and again, I think even the names of these clusters, they're a bit, possibly a bit offensive. You know, I wouldn't like to be known as someone that's in a dramatic cluster um, or the eccentric or the kind of anxious, fearful. You know, so I think already the way that we categorize these disorders, there's already a little bit of judgment there, already a little bit of stigma. Um, it tends to be the ones in cluster B uh, that people are a bit more familiar with. Um, so antisocial personality disorder. Um, if you've ever kind of watched any sort of like cop show profiling program, you know, you hear terms like psychopath, sociopath banded about, that tends to be kind of reflective of someone with an antisocial personality disorder, uh, that kind of profile. Um, and this is just a breakdown from the DSM-5, which is the statistical manual for kind of mental health conditions. It's very American text, uh, but this just goes through the key features of some of these uh, disorders. So borderline, which is another term in, used interchangeably with EUPD, um, kind of instability of interpersonal relationships and marked impulsivity. And we'll have a look at those uh, symptoms in a little bit more detail. Um, and I'm not going to read through all of these, but it just gives you an idea um, of the kind of snapshot um, summary of what someone with that diagnosis might typically experience. Um, <clears throat> these are what we call maladaptive cognitions. So these are unhelpful um, thought processes that a person with a given personality disorder might experience. So these kind of um, processes, cognitions, thoughts about the world tend to be pretty common. So if you've got an avoidant personality uh, disorder, you may feel that if people get to know you, they will reject you. That results in you then avoiding contact or building friendships because of that ultimate fear that you will at some point be rejected. 
Um, antisocial, you can see it's very different. There's a kind of more of a malicious streak there, I suppose. And that's looking to exploit people, thinking that people let their guard down and therefore they are kind of deserving of being exploited. If you're paranoid type, you might have the cognition that it's foolish to trust anyone, that people are out to get you. Um, and these cognitions translate into behaviour. So again, you know, someone's put this together on a bit of a spectrum. Um, so you can see that they're kind of clustered together. Perhaps a paranoid would be most distant from obsessive compulsive. Um, but again, some people can have multiple personality disorders. There's a lot of debate even within psychiatry if these are valid. Um, I think because our personality is so unique, the experience and the treatment and the care that you provide for people with the same personality disorder will be very, very different. And I guess that's where we contrast a lot from more traditional medical diagnoses in which the treatment is largely the same, will be derived from a nice guideline, whether that's asthma, diabetes, you know, the treatment paradigm will be pretty, pretty standardized. But this, within the mental health setting, you are really working with the person uh, with their very unique ways of thinking and behaving. So I've mentioned this already, 9 to 15% of the population uh, will have a personality disorder. EUPD is much more common in females, um, or rather it's much more often diagnosed in females. And I think if you look at the history, I think psychiatry is a profession which is steeped in a little bit of misogyny. You know, you might well have seen those things shared on social media, kind of the ridiculous reasons that people have been sectioned for in the past. You know, things like having a child out of wedlock, being hysterical. Um, and, you know, mental health hasn't got the kind of best history when it comes to how we treated certain people uh, for things that these days are very normal. You know, you know, a woman sleeping around, oh my goodness, you know, back in the day, that could get you in a psychiatric hospital. So I think we need to be mindful of this kind of history um, of misogyny, um, of treating women as perhaps problematic. I think EUPD is one that's associated with being quite distressed. Um, and I wonder if it's because perhaps if women are displaying those behaviours, they're much more likely to become coming to contact with services um, and then much more likely to get that diagnosis. Whereas, and I don't know the figures on this, I'm just speculating, but you know, men tend to get the antisocial personality disorder rather than the EUPD. What we know is that around 60 to 70% of the prison population will have a personality disorder. And I think a lot of that comes from the fact that many of these PDs um, are associated with an element of impulsivity, not being able to hold back, um, you know, might well get involved in kind of criminal type behaviour. Um, so you're going to end up in jail or prison. So we'll have a think now about EUPD. Um, otherwise known as borderline personality disorder. That tends to be the name it goes by in America. Um, and you've probably seen someone portrayed in kind of film or TV with this diagnosis. Um, off the top of my head, I think the 90s film Girl Interrupted with uh, Angelina Jolie. That's about a group of young women in the 60s uh, who get admitted to psychiatric hospital, the, the kind of the bonds that form between them. Quite an interesting watch, but again, I wouldn't say it is perhaps the most realistic uh, portrayal, but I don't think film or TV kind of has its best interest. You know, it's not in the interest of the producers to portray something accurately when they could portray something dramatically. So <clears throat> there are several diagnostic criteria uh, that are used to reach a diagnosis of EUPD. Um, you'll see here the one, you can probably see how they start to make the link between cognitions and behaviours. Uh, so you might feel very worried about people abandoning you and you might go to extreme lengths to stop that from happening. 
you might have very intense emotions that can last from a few hours to a few days and they can oscillate very, very quickly. You might not have a strong sense of who you are um, and your personality can change significantly depending on who you're with. And now in the long term, that can actually cause relationships to fail. You know, if, if you are seen to be, I suppose, not consistent in your values, your beliefs, etc. What we tend to see, you know, people with EUPD may well form relationships very, very intensely in that honeymoon period. Uh, they may well adapt to make lots of changes to fit in with their partner. But before long, there becomes this kind of black and white thinking where someone that you once idolized, maybe even only a few days ago, you suddenly, they're kind of public enemy number one. And this kind of translates into some difficulties with making and maintaining stable relationships. Uh, people report this kind of persistent feeling of emptiness, feeling hollow. I think that stems from the perhaps abuse um, and the, the impact that has on your neural development. Uh, you might well do impulsive things to do things that could harm you, such as binge eating, using drugs, driving dangerously, maybe having sex with casual partners, you know, not using protection. Um, and we, we label those behaviors slightly differently from kind of actual self-harm or suicide attempts. Um, you can probably see the distinction in that this first one is not with the intent to harm yourself or end your life. It's more that you get harmed or damaged as a result. Um, feelings of anger, uh, which can be quite difficult to control. Uh, and there may well be an element of dissociation, which is kind of just tuning out from your surroundings, from your immediate environment in times of kind of stress or anxiety. So for a diagnosis to be made, five out of nine, at least five out of nine need to be present and they need to be present over a period of time. And they also need to interfere with daily life to the extent that it's causing considerable distress or impact. You know, so people with EUPD uh, that's very mild or only meet a few of the criteria will probably be able to function completely normally. But if you can imagine, if you've got all nine of these or eight or seven, you're probably going to have difficulties in the workplace. You're probably going to have difficulties, you know, uh, meeting a partner, keeping a healthy relationship. So there are significant impacts uh, the more severe the personality disorder is. So I think the diagnosis is controversial. There's debate within mental health on is it a good diagnosis? Does it reflect the people that are labelled with it? Um, this is, you know, a lot of people feel that being labelled with this disordered personality is not very kind. Uh, it's a bit upsetting because it's not, it's not kind of, a personality illness it's a disorder which implies that that person is kind of broken or there's something wrong with them and again it perhaps puts the responsibility on that person to change to fit into their setting uh, rather than the kind of well let's look at the conditions that caused that i found this on a little blog post <clears throat> Um, someone's made that kind of to reflect their own experiences. Um, and I thought it was quite a useful way of thinking about it. You know, this lady's saying, I thought that growing up in a crap neighborhood with no money, being abused by my uncle and supporting my alcoholic parents would be enough for society to understand why I'm prone to breaking down from time to time. But she's in there, you know, turns out I've just got a disorder personality and I need to change the way I relate to the world. So, for a lot of people, it can feel like quite an isolating uh, diagnosis. On the flip side, many people I've worked with with EUPD have found that getting the diagnosis helps them to understand their experiences. It helps them to articulate their, themselves um, and it opens up treatment pathways. You know, until you label it, um, you're not eligible for the support that's going to help you get a handle on these difficult thoughts and emotions. So real mixed bag. And I think, <clears throat> you know, it's important that we don't make sweeping changes as a result of one set of feedback 
and then end up upsetting the people who do find it quite helpful um, to have that diagnosis. Even specialists will agree, uh, sort of disagree with each other. Um, psychiatrists have very different ways in which they approach the management um, of people with personality disorder. Um, I think the application of the criteria is quite subjective. You know, thinking about that list of, of, of nine symptoms, to me, that could describe any one of us on a bad day, you know, particularly in our adolescence or early 20s. Um, and it might just be that you've got the bad luck to have ended up in front of a psychiatrist while you've got a lot going on. And then you end up with this diagnosis that's on your record, quite difficult to shift for the, for the rest of your life. What we tend to find as well is that people grow out of their diagnosis, sort of when they get to their 30s, 40s, 50s, people naturally mellow out. And so they no longer fit the criteria. And I think that's opened up some debate. You know, if, if this is something that is so fleeting that you eventually shed it off, is it really a valid diagnosis? I don't have the answer to that. I don't think there is an easy answer, um, but I just wanted to make you aware of that perspective. Um, and again, I've kind of said that, you know, a lot of people feel that the disorder element of the diagnosis is stigmatizing in itself. And I think language evolves all the time within healthcare. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to move away from this idea of calling people what their diagnosis is, you know, so the diabetic in bed three, the schizophrenic, you know, I think it's much more respectful to say the person with schizophrenia, the person living with HIV, uh, the person living with diabetes, because we are so much more than any one diagnosis. Um, I've kind of said that there, I think, you know, I'm in the middle for those people that find it helpful. That's wonderful. Um, but I also think there is an overlap between mental health diagnoses. I think if you're having to make a diagnosis, sometimes on the back of a 60 minute consultation, there's a lot of pressure there to get that right. And there's a lot of margin to get it wrong. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not a fan of a, a diagnosis sticking with someone for the rest of their life if that's ultimately kind of unhelpful to them. And maybe, you know, just do a bit of self-reflection about the things that we've covered. You know, have your views on personality disorder changed? Have you come to this session with any preconceived ideas? Um, be interested to hear that perhaps in the, the, the chat and the Q&A. So in terms of treatment and management, uh, key questions that I want to look at here, um, the main treatment options are talking therapies. Um, all the evidence suggests that if you can do therapy, often quite intensive therapy, that is the best thing to help people rewire their brains and stop having that unhealthy link between difficult or unhelpful thoughts that translate into negative actions. Now, the one that not many people have heard of this, especially if you don't work in mental health, uh, DBT is the therapy which is licensed for EUPD. And that really helps people to just sit with difficult emotions, helps them to become less responsive, less angry. Um, one of the ways that people with EUPD describe their thoughts, is it's very black and white. You know, there's no grey, there's no middle ground. DBT helps people to accept that it doesn't have to be all good, all bad. You can exist with a grey area and that's absolutely fine. And bringing that in to your psyche makes you kind of less prone to extreme behaviours. Uh, lots of different therapies can be useful depending on the presenting problem. You know, so if it's someone who is kind of obsessional um, or compulsive, CBT can help to rewire some of those thoughts. Uh, CAT, analytical therapy, takes a bit more of a deeper dive into your history of relationships, the way that you relate to people. Uh, that can be very important for people who have gone through abuse um, and kind of are held back from healthy relationships because of this fear 
um, of being hurt, of being let down, of being abandoned. Uh, this was a nice quote from someone who went through DBT. Uh, and, you know, they found that very, very helpful to the extent that they were able to get off medication um, and just had this great sense of self-acceptance, which I think you're not perhaps going to get with a medication. I think care planning, you know, if you do work with people with EUPD, even if you're not the primary care planner or giver, I think there are a lot of things that you can do. Just being compassionate. Don't label people as attention seeking. Uh, treat the person in a kind of holistic way. Acknowledge that when people present to services, that's a positive thing. I think if people harm themselves, present to services, and they'll get told they're an attention seeker, that just makes people not want to engage in healthcare and actually increases their risk of suicide and self harm. Um, you know, encourage self care, self soothing. Quite often, it's the individual who understands themselves the best. So collaborative care plans are really good. You know, it's it's good practice to develop a crisis plan with someone when they're not in a crisis and then they feel a sense of ownership uh, over that care plan that they've made. Obviously, a &E is there if someone uh, has self-harmed, feels that they are going to kill themselves, hurt themselves. But try and avoid, you know, go to a and &E as the first stage of any crisis plan. Try and make a few steps that people can work through because a and &E isn't pleasant for anyone, you know, let alone people with mental health conditions. Uh, risk assessment. Again, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. I think unless you are a qualified mental health nurse or a psychiatrist, you're probably not going to be managing the bulk um, of the risk. Uh, but just general kind of uh, tips for any kind of assessment, address the long-term and immediate risks. Try and make it as collaborative as possible. Focus on the strengths in a person's uh, network. You know, look at perhaps the good friends that they do have, family, uh, pets. Uh, a lot of people with EUPD, uh, make really good caregivers because they find that looking after someone else takes them out of their own head, gives them a bit of purpose. So again, that can be a strength. That can be a reason not to end your life. If you feel that you're kind of looking after someone else, that gives you a role. Like general tips for working with anyone in a crisis. Uh, and there is a whole other webinar from me on communication skills within mental health settings. Uh, but again, just to recap, you know, always stay calm, non-threatening. You know, I've worked with some terrible mental health nurses that just meet aggression and hostility with aggression and attitude. And that is not in the spirit of de-escalation. You know, we're the professional. They're the person that's struggling. It's up to us to kind of really bring down the emotions, try to understand the crisis from the other person's point of view look through those kind of reasons for distress and validate that, you know, because quite often these people have very, very difficult lives, complex past, history of trauma. Uh, so they're already a little bit distrustful um, of people in authority, in healthcare. Drug treatment is an absolute no-no. So technically, there, there's no drug treatment for the personality disorder alone. But a lot of people have comorbid sort of anxiety and depression. Um, and that's fine. If they have a diagnosis of depression alongside, then you could treat that with antidepressants. But what we see is bad prescribing where people are put on sedatives, antipsychotics, even though they're not, they've not got psychosis, just to make them easier to manage. You know, as far as I'm concerned, that's a form of chemical restraint. That is not good care. Um, and there is no one medication which is licensed to treat a personality disorder. Uh, drug treatment during a crisis, you know, again, case by case basis, if someone is acutely distressed, uh, you may want to consider some PRM, some lorazepam, some diazepam. Uh, but again, we don't want that to become a crux. We don't want that to become a, a long term uh, treatment. But certainly, you know, in the same way that we would offer this kind of medication to anyone who was in acute anxious state or distress, then that could be considered. 
what we don't want to do is take all uh, medication options off the card when they are appropriate because that just kind of keeps people uh, in a longer period of distress and suffering. I think just as we're moving on to kind of wrap up now, a few important points to remember. You know, personality disorder is real. Many people, even within mental health services, say, oh, you know, it's not the same. It's, it's, it's not for us. It absolutely is. You know, these are people with valid experiences that need support, that are deserving of care. You know, quite often their disorder will cause them, you know, significant problems in their life with relationships with others with jobs etc as i've kind of said very easy to dismiss the person with personality disorder as attention seeking manipulative but i think take a step back often the person doesn't have much of a choice over these behaviors yes you could yes they've got capacity you know they know what they're doing they're not incapacitated but a lot of these uh, kind of ways that they relate to other people are formed in childhood and are so, so ingrained that without intensive therapy, um, it's very hard to actually break those cycles. Uh, kind of think about the suicidality, always be thinking about risks. Uh, any kind of self-harm should be taken seriously. And if that self-harm is getting worse or seems to be escalating, always get some advice around that. Like, you know, just kind of standard tips for anyone working with uh, someone with a personality disorder. Avoid stigmatizing language. Reinforce the positive behaviors. You know, acknowledge that it must have been difficult to seek support, attend hospital. But thank you for coming. We can help you. Provide that reassurance. Build rapport. You know, I, a lot of people I worked with who have a personality disorder really respond well to humor. They tend to have quite, you know, quite good self-awareness around what they're like because it's more kind of tied into their personality rather than, say, an illness like depression, which is more something that they are kind of suffering through. Uh, remember your therapeutic use of self in healthcare. We are the most valuable resource. You know, it's good interactions with us that result in better patient outcomes and don't ever kind of downplay the importance of yourself um, as a therapeutic tool. Patients really do pick up on your attitude, tone, and your warmth. So check yourself as well. You know, think about your own self-care. If you've got a lot of issues at home, if you're struggling with certain things and you're not bringing your full self to your job, maybe you could do with some support either through occupational health or, you know, getting some supervision, doing something to pamper yourself a bit of self-care because we're only human as well. Uh, and I'm just going to, we're not going to fully go through it, but I think it would be worth uh, everyone having a look up of, at this paper, uh, done by a gentleman called Jim Bolton. Um, and his paper was called, We've Got Another One For You, a phrase I heard all the time in liaison psychiatry, you know, when people wanted to make a referral of someone with a mental health condition. And he looked at various hospitals across the country, uh, he looked at mental health staff, he looked at the kind of attitudes and the stigma, and it was quite shocking that he found 75% witness stigma um, and 75% actually experienced that as a mental health worker themselves. You know, these were some of the comments made about staff, who's madder, you are the patients, you must be thick to go into psychiatry. That was their colleagues in the general hospital were saying that. And I think if that's your starting place about your colleagues, I dread to think what your views are about the kind of patients that you might well be supporting. And these were some of the awful findings, you know, the actual direct impact on care. You know, people have been given cold showers, uh, patients with suicidal ideation being left in wet clothes after jumping into a river. Uh, be left unsupervised uh, or at the same time you know receiving inadequate physical healthcare investigation through uh, what we call uh, diagnostic overshadowing so if you present and you've got anxiety in your case record everything is then dismissed as your anxiety you know and they found that someone delayed the treatment of septicemia by several days because it was sort of seen as oh it's mental health you know they're not really they're not really ill 
So do look that paper up. It's an interesting read, a bit of a harrowing read. Uh, and we'll close now and I will take some questions. <laughs> 